for the Bible tells me so. Those words come from a famous children's Christian song, Jesus Loves Me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. For a conservative Bible-believing Christian, what we know about life, what we know about Jesus, what we know about God, salvation, eternity, we know because the Bible tells us so. We take the Bible as God's authoritative, perfect, infallible, inerrant Word of God. So we believe what we believe about Jesus and things eternal because the Bible tells us so. But why do we believe the Bible? If you're talking to an unbeliever, someone who doesn't accept the Word of God as the Word of God, how would you convince them that the Bible is God's Word, that it's true? How can I know that the Bible is true? If you ask most Christians why they believe what they believe, they'll say, because the Bible tells me so. But if you ask them, why do you believe the Bible is true, Sometimes we have a difficult time answering that question. So let's talk for a moment about how we can know that the Bible's God's Word, 100% true. Most Christians who answer this question will answer, because the Bible tells me so. They will quote 2 Timothy 3.16 or some other verse about the Bible's inspiration. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And so, they will say, the Bible tells us it's true. But of course, this is circular reasoning. You can't believe someone is Napoleon because they say they're Napoleon. Let's see some ID. Napoleon died hundreds of years ago. We have to understand that circular reasoning may be good for us, but it's not good for someone who doesn't believe the Word of God will not be a good argument, a logical argument for the inspiration, the inerrancy, the divine nature of Scripture. So this is not really an adequate reason. What if another book says it is totally 100% true? Do you believe it? No. Well, then why believe the Bible for that reason? Jesus even said as much in John 5, 31. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. We need two or three witnesses, and not just what I say I am. The police officer asks for my driver's license, for my photo ID. What does someone other than me say about it? They said to him, John 8, 13, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Most people will not accept self-witness. It's one of the rules of law. You need to have two or three witnesses. So because it says so, it might be convincing for you, but it won't be convincing for many, and really shouldn't be the answer that we give. Others will say, well, because my pastor believes it, because my parents believed it, because my friend who's really smart believes it. And that may be why many of us do believe in the Bible, because the Bible, because the pastor says it, my Sunday school teacher says it, my friend says it. But that's not really a good reason, is it? Because they could be wrong. How about because I have a feeling when I read the Word of God, I just know there's a burning in my heart. Well, the Book of Mormon purports to be the Word of God. And their reason for it is because you will have a feeling. That feeling is subjective, and our feelings can be wrong, right? How many times have you been sure you were right and you had a gut feeling? But our gut feelings can be wrong as well. This is perhaps reason enough for you in the hymn, He Lives. You ask me how I know He lives? He lives within my heart. Well, how do you know that? You have a feeling. But maybe it's just indigestion. Maybe it's just elation. That's not a good argument for others to believe it, is it? How about because of fulfilled prophecy? Ah, now we're getting somewhere. The Bible's full of fulfilled prophecy. Well, most of those prophecies are hundreds or thousands of years old. And the only no way that we know when they were made and they were made before, not after the occurrence, is because it's in the Bible and even if we can prove all of the prophecies in the Bible that have come true already did come true, 
that doesn't mean that all the ones that are yet future will come true. So can we really be sure the Bible has many, many prophecies that have been fulfilled, but what about the ones, perhaps, about his second coming? They haven't come true yet. Is that convincing to others? That's more convincing. There's a good place you could start pointing. Look at the prophecies of Christ's birth. But that's not the answer I think we're looking for. Some will say because of scientific and archaeological evidence. Yes, scientists look into the statements of Scripture, historians, the science, and even archaeological digs. But what of those things that haven't been proven true? What, of the, what if everything in the Bible is true historically, but how can we ever prove that it's true when it comes to the spiritual? What God is. It might get everything right about math, about history, about the world, about outer space. But how can we trust it when it comes to something more important than that, eternity? And then, of course, there is the answer when we've exhausted all the other answers. Well, because of faith. But, of course, those who believe in other faiths and the books of those faiths, like the Koran, like the Book of Mormon, they believe it because of faith as well. Atheists, evolutionists believe in evolution because of faith. They say science, but it's actually faith. So can we say faith? Well, we can say faith. We do take it by faith. But what if our faith is wrong? What I would like us to pursue today is this question. How can I know the Bible's true without appealing to the Bible as self-witness? Hi, my name is Pastor Jeff Hartman, pastor of Stamford Baptist Church on High Ridge Road in Stamford, Connecticut. And I'd like us to study tonight in our first study of many on the Bible itself, where we learn about God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, humanity, salvation, sin, eternity. Let's start with the Bible, and let's start with how can we know that the Bible is true. I'd like to give you a way that you can have not just faith, but faith in something certain, and something that you can share with someone who isn't already a believer in the Bible. And it would be akin to one of those that we just appealed to, because so-and-so believes it. But this is what is called an appeal to an authority. Now look, if you get diagnosed with cancer, you don't have to go to medical school to find out what to do. You go and you ask your doctor, and you trust your doctor, even though the doctor is not God, the doctor's not 100% right all the time, but you trust them because they're an authority. If you get in trouble with the law, you need to get a lawyer. And you go to the lawyer not because they're perfect, not because they're God, but because they're an authority. They have a law degree, they practice law, and so you trust that they know more about the subject than you do. Well, appealing to authority is a shortcut to finding out the truth. If you don't know the truth, you used to look in a dictionary or an encyclopedia and trust that authority, a textbook. Now you might go online. Don't believe everything you see online. But do you need to go to medical school, need to go to law school, need to do the experiments yourself, or can you trust an authority? In most cases, in many cases throughout life, we trust an authority. We have to make sure that authority is one. Let me appeal to the greatest authority there would be on the Bible, and how about the one that the Bible tells us about, Jesus Christ? Not my pastor, not a seminary professor, but what does Jesus say about the Bible? Now, we'll get to how can we know that Jesus is true in a moment, because the way you know your doctor, because they've got a diploma on the wall, you know that they have passed some tests. Well, we'll look to how we can trust that authority in a moment. But this authority, Jesus, is the most famous person who ever lived. We even date our calendars according to his appearance on the earth. We've just finished the Christmas season as I preach this. And the whole world celebrates Christmas, the time that Christ came into the world, why we've changed our calendar to before Christ and in the year of our Lord. As a result of him coming to the world, the most famous person in the world, Let's see what he says about the Bible. Let me tell you up front that Jesus endorsed Scripture 
A hundred percent of it. Wait a minute, you say, it wasn't even all written when Jesus lived. Well, wait a minute. Let's talk first about Jesus endorsing the Old Testament. The 39 books in the Old Testament, the Jewish people of Christ's day in the first century, they had those books. And so Jesus, what did he think about the scriptures? Well, in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Matthew 5, 18, Assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. I like to say that all means all, and that's all all means. Jesus didn't say some of the scripture is inspiring. Jesus said all of it is true, and it will come to pass. Not one bit will pass away. Not one bit is wrong. Not one jot or one tittle. Not one word, not one sentence, not one paragraph, not one book, but not even a jot or a tittle. Now for us, we don't know what a jot or a tittle is. So let me explain to you what a jot is. A jot is a Hebrew letter from the Hebrew alphabet. It is the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's pronounced yod in Hebrew, and here it is. To put it next to a normal Hebrew letter, which takes up the whole space, that's a resh that represents a Hebrew R, takes up from the top to the bottom. But a yod, our letter I or J, only takes up like an apostrophe. It looks like an apostrophe, but it is a yod. <coughs> and yod is the smallest letter. Jesus says not one word, not even the smallest Hebrew letter will pass away till it all is fulfilled. But let me tell you what a tittle is. And a tittle is not even a Hebrew letter. It's a part of a Hebrew letter. Let's look at that resh and compare it to a daleth, the Hebrew D, and they look very similar. But what you notice the difference is they both look like a seven to us. The resh has a line up and a line down. <coughs> daleth has the line across and down, but a little hangover. And that little hangover smaller than the little squiggle that makes an O into a Q. That's a tittle. You can compare in your Bible, most Bibles have in Psalm 119, the 22 Hebrew letters. <coughs> and if you look at the Daleth above verse 25 and the Resh above verse 153, you will see the difference between these two letters. Some of our letters look similar, like the O and the Q, but the Daleth and the Resh look even more similar than any English letters. And Jesus said, not the smallest letter and not the smallest part of a Hebrew letter will pass away. Forget the book, the paragraph, the sentence, or the word. Not even one letter or a part of a letter, because it's all true. It's God's word. <clears throat> he says in John 10, 35, the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken. We do break scripture, but we break ourselves on it. But scripture still is true. Jesus believed in the authority of scripture. You can't believe in Jesus and not believe in the Bible. How would you believe in Jesus without the Bible? There are some who call themselves Christians who don't believe the Bible is God's word. But what did Jesus believe about God's word? He believed it to be God's word. He said it can't be broken. He believed it was God's word, that he was the fulfillment of Scripture. He believed 100% of the Old Testament. But, you say, Christianity is based on the New Testament. The 27 books that were written after Jesus died, rose again according to Scripture, and went to heaven. What about the New Testament? Do you know that Jesus endorsed the New Testament as well? Let me show you. In John 14, 6, recorded by John, one of Jesus' 12 disciples, Jesus said to them in the upper room, The Helper, the Holy Spirit, will teach you, who? These 12 men there, the apostles, among them Matthew and John, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John give us a record of what Jesus said and what Jesus did. John and Matthew in that room Mark may have been in that room, but he learned from Peter who was in that room, 
And then Luke learned from Mary and others who were in that room. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance, when you write down these things, the Holy Spirit will guide you. And that is the history part of Scripture. The history part of Scripture is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts. Luke is the writer of Acts, and God brings to his remembrance all the things that happened. And so what we see is that the history part, the first five books of the 27 of the New Testament, Jesus endorses. In John 14, 26, he talks about the doctrinal part, which would be Romans through Jude. The helper, the Holy Spirit, will teach you all things. So we have the history, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then we have those books from Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, all the way to 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, that doctrinal section, the teaching, the epistles, we call them, the letters. He will teach you all things. That would be the bulk of the New Testament. Every book except for Revelation, which is prophecy. So we have the historical part, Matthew to Acts, and we have the doctrinal part, John 16, 13, the doctrinal part. Only one other book in the New Testament, we call that prophetic and future, and that's Revelation. And Jesus said in John 16, 13, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, that's the epistles again, and he will tell you things to come. Among those there was John, the author of Revelation. That's not just speculation about how the world might end. That is God speaking to John and telling him things to come. And so we see Jesus endorsing not only just the Old Testament, but he endorsed the New Testament, all of it, 100%. Now we have to come to the next part. You just don't go to someone and say, hey, I've got a stomach ache. What do you think I should do? You go to a doctor. You go to an expert. How do you know they're an expert? Well, you usually trust the fact that they are opening an office. Sometimes people open an office and they practice medicine without a license. But most of the time, we go by some faith. But if you have questions, you can find out if they actually went to school. You could look at the diploma. You could call the school. How can we investigate whether Jesus is or is not a real authority on the Bible? Who would be a better one than Jesus? Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, claimed to be equal with the Father, and we believe Jesus is God because of the resurrection. If there's one thing that proves to me, that proves to most Christians that Jesus is God, it's his resurrection, his prophecy that he would rise, and the truth that he did rise. We believe in the Bible because Jesus said it was God's word, and we believe Jesus because of the resurrection. <clears throat> Matthew 27, verse 36, this is not Jesus speaking, but this is his enemies, who when Jesus died, went to the king and said, Sir, we remember while he was alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Jesus prophesied over and over and over again that he would rise from the dead. His disciples didn't get it. They didn't hear it. When Jesus died, they were, they were just blown away. They, they didn't remember that Jesus said he would die. They forgot that he said that he would rise again. But his enemies heard him. This is the testimony of those who didn't believe Jesus. He prophesied that he would rise, and he prophesied not just someday, specifically in three days. Now, that's an incredible prophecy for someone to make before they die. You can't make it after you die. He said it over and over again when they asked for a sign, Matthew 12, 39. No sign will be given to this generation except the sign of the prophet Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. What happened to Jonah after three days and three nights? He didn't die. He came back to the land. The whale spit him up. And so this is Jesus, one of the many predictions of Jesus' resurrection. Jesus appealed not to the miracles, not to his wisdom, not to his credentials, his education. Jesus appealed to one thing. Do you want to believe in me? Believe in me because of the resurrection. 
I don't believe because of the feeding of the 5,000, because of the walking on the water, because of the calming the storm, because of the healings, even the resurrections. I believe because of his resurrection, because that's what Jesus appealed to. Now, he predicted his own resurrection. And here's how we know that he rose. He rose, it's historical evidence that Jesus rose. Even his enemies admit that he predicted his own resurrection. He was executed. We have secular history that tells us that Christ, if we know anything, an unbeliever, Josephus, tells us he was crucified. He was pronounced dead by an expert, a soldier who spent all day every day executing criminals. He was buried. We know that. The seal was broken. Even the soldiers admit that. The seal was broken at risk of their life. They admitted that the seal was broken. The stone was rolled away. The tomb was empty. The grave clothes were left. These facts are historical and can't be argued against. If anyone had reason to show that the tomb was still full, it would have been the Jews who rejected him and the Romans who executed him. But neither the Jews nor the Romans could produce a body and disprove the resurrection because... The tomb was empty. If we know anything historically, it's that Jesus died and that the tomb was empty. How do you explain those facts? The body was never produced by enemies. And then he appeared to many. Not just in vague visions, but he appeared to 500 at one time. And to people who were so sure that Jesus was alive that they were willing to risk their lives and in many cases gave their lives for testimony to the fact that Jesus, who died, was alive. His followers were transformed from cowards into world beaters who were willing to die and indeed did go to the death, proclaiming, Jesus rose from the dead, therefore we have hope. And so these are the historical facts. How do we know those historical facts? We'll get there in a moment. But there have been many who have tried to disprove the resurrection as the cornerstone of Christianity. But when you look at the historical evidence, it is so convincing that many of those skeptics have become believers themselves. Because how do you explain the empty tomb? How do you explain? Oh, well, some robbers went in and stole the body. Oh, yeah? And they overcame the soldiers? Well, the disciples, no, the disciples were afraid and locked in their own room. What happened? Well, the Jews and the Romans couldn't produce a body it's pretty convincing evidence that something happened. And then all those people who saw him. You see, we believe that the Bible's God's word because Jesus says it is. And we believe Jesus because we say he's God because he rose from the dead on the third day as it predicted. So to vindicate history, resurrection is not a theological idea, theory, postulation. The resurrection is history. Either it happened or it didn't. If the resurrection happened, which is what every Easter celebrates, not just spring, not the Easter bunny, but the resurrection, if it happened, it's history. If it didn't, it's a myth. How do you explain it away? Let's find out how we can know the resurrection is fact. Here is the way that we can show that the resurrection actually happened. Because the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are reliable history. I'm not using circular reasoning here that says, well, I believe the Bible's true because I believe that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are true. I'm not saying that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are 100% true. I'm saying they are reliable history. And for this, we can use a science called history itself. So if we use the science, the history, the science of history, all we have to show is that the Gospels are reliable history. There are four criteria for reliable history. We can use the science of reliable history. So let's now go through the science of history. History is not an exact science because you can't reproduce experiments like you can in chemistry or biology. But it is a science, and they do have laws that they use to determine what is reliable history. And so we're not asking for perfect history. No history written by a human being is ever perfect. But are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John reliable historians? Here are the four characteristics 
of reliable history. How can we know what happened to JFK when he was assassinated November 22nd, 1963? Who was our first president? What happened in 1500? Well, one of the things that we want to look for is eyewitness character. Eyewitness character means we want to have history that is written by, spoken by, derived from someone who actually saw it. If you want a witness to a, an accident, you don't want someone who heard about it, you want someone who actually saw it. An eyewitness is the most reliable witness that you can get. So, were there eyewitnesses? Remember, it needs to be, for an accurate historian, it needs to be first or second hand. First or second hand means someone who saw it or someone who talked to someone who saw it. And so someone can be a reliable historian by getting it directly from the eyewitnesses, the direct sources. So an eyewitness character is either first and generate or second generation. Remember, Matthew and John are first generation eyewitnesses. Matthew and John were there those three years with Jesus. They saw all the miracles. They heard all the words. They knew him. And Luke, he talked to Mary. He talked to the other disciples. He was a great historian. He did a lot of investigating, a lot of interviewing. And then we also have Mark, who might have been that young man who escaped uh, leaving his cloak behind at the resurrection, according to Mark. That might have been him serving in the upper room. We do know that Mark got his stories from Peter. So all four of these historians are at least eyewitness character according to general history. We're not talking about theology here. We're talking about history. And so the New Testament, we're not talking about the New Testament. We're just talking about the four Gospels. According to history, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they do pass this test, the first test, with flying colors. The second thing we need for reliable history is manuscript reliability. How many copies of the original do we have? How close to the originals are they? Remember, before the printing press was invented in the 16th century, everything was copied by hand. And so copied by hand, there might be a lot of mistakes, and it's 2,000 years ago. So how can we be sure that we even have what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John actually wrote? About the manuscripts, we have to ask how many are available. If there's only one copy, if there's only two copies and they disagree, how do we know which one is right? If there's only one copy, how do we know that they didn't get anything wrong? We want there to be a lot of copies, and then we want them to be close to the time. So how many manuscripts are available? Now I want to compare these four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to other books of antiquity. Of Plato, several centuries before Christ, of Plato we have seven copies. Now seven is much better than one. It's much better than two. If you have seven copies, that's pretty good because if six out of seven agree, you go with that. Aristotle, not so much. There's five copies. Five is better than one. Five is better than two. But that's how many copies that we have left of Plato. How many copies we have of Aristotle. No one argues about the historicity of Plato or Aristotle, especially based upon manuscript evidence. We assume what we have about Plato or Aristotle is fairly accurate, and we're pretty close, but of the New Testament, and specifically Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we have 13,000 copies. 13,000 copies. There is a huge difference between Plato and Aristotle, which no one questions the historicity of, and the four Gospels. We have so many copies. Now let me go on a tangent here for a moment. Why is that? Perhaps because nobody takes Plato's name in vain or Aristotle's name in vain. Nobody stakes their life on Plato or Aristotle, but people take Jesus' name in vain because they know he's special. And people copy by hand Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because they believe that Jesus is God, that they believe Jesus rose from the dead, 
and indeed Jesus has changed their life. This is testimony to us that the Bible's true because people have given their lives in order to reproduce the Word of God. That's why we have so many copies. But let's not talk about that now. Let's just talk about how much historical evidence is there for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that they are reliable history. How many manuscripts? Many more than any other ancient book. If you throw out the Bible because there are a few errors in a couple of copies, then you throw out every ancient book because the New Testament, and especially Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are highly attested to by many, many, many more copies than any other. And by the way, there's so many that when there are errors, they stand out because so many of the 13,000 agree in every respect. And those few that are deficient, they stand out as wrong. Are the manuscripts accurate? Well, actually, we have to ask that question. How accurate are they? Do they agree? And in this case, they agree. 98% of them agree in almost every single detail. There are a few manuscripts that are missing this or missing that, or there's errors, but they stand out. Are they accurate? Yes. If you judge this book by any historical, not theological, any historical perspective, it, there's many, they are accurate, and here's that third question. How far away are they? Well, Shakespeare, the most, the closest to Shakespeare we have is about 500 years after he lived and died. If you go to the New Testament, it was written 1900 years ago. Well, Shakespeare was written 500 years ago, let me say. New Testament was written 1900, 2000 years ago. How close are we? Proximity. How close to Shakespeare? Well, the manuscript proximity for Plato, Plato lived before Christ, but we don't have anything about Plato till 1,200 years after he lived and died. 1,200 years, Aristotle, 1,400 years. We don't have anything close to the time when they lived. When it comes to Shakespeare, it's several hundred years. But when it comes to the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we have copies of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that could be as close to 50 years after Jesus lived and died. By far, the New Testament, and specifically Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, pass as accurate history because the manuscript reliability, there's more copies, they agree more, and they're closer to the actual occurrences than any other ancient book. If you throw out the Bible for either of these two characteristics, you throw out every book, before the printing press. How about internal harmony? If it's going to be accurate history, it has to agree with other accurate history. And so if you have two different biographies of George Washington, a couple of hundred years old, and you read two and they differ on some very important things, you don't know which one is right. But do they have internal harmony. Maybe they give a, you know, just a different way of looking at it, like seeing an accident from four different perspectives. Or is it just wildly inaccurate? Well, with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we have internal harmony. Are there some problems between them? Yes. But actually, if you look at them, they tell the same story with many of the same stories repeated with very, very much close. It just seems like the same story. He died. He rose again. Twelve apostles, the names. A few things are a little bit hard, but internal harmony means harmony, not unison. If everyone tells the exact same story, oftentimes what historians say is we have them coming from the same source, corroboration. And so they get in and they all get together and they get their stories straight. One of my favorite stories <clears throat> about multiple witnesses is four young men who came late to the final exam and when the teacher uh, asked for their excuse they said we had a flat tire the teacher tested them and said okay which tire was it well they couldn't tell even though they supposedly changed it because they they got together and they cooked up a story but they forgot to cook up which tire it was here, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they tell the same story from four different perspectives. They tell it 
in different ways so we get different perspectives, but they're telling the same story, and there is internal harmony. Harmony is two different notes that go together, and that's what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John give to us. The last one is external corroboration, is other science, is other history, back it up, or are, is this supposed history going against what everyone everywhere says? External corroboration means you can't discover that this town didn't exist, this person didn't live then. External corroboration means does it go with what we already know? There's a difference, but there's agreement. And here, we want to know about science and archaeology. And so if we look at external corroboration, we see for hundreds of years, archaeologists going to the Middle East who say, well, we know that David never existed, but then they find archaeological proof that David did exist and was king. They said that Moses couldn't have written Genesis or Exodus because they didn't have writing then, and then we discovered they did have writing then. And if anyone could write, it would have been Moses, educated in the Pharaoh's very household. Yes, every time science doubted Scripture, Scripture seems to justify itself. External corroboration, every time an archaeologist puts a shovel into the dirt in the Middle East, an atheist quakes because they're discovering that there was a Jericho and the walls did fall, that there was a Pontius Pilate. We're discovering the, we're discovering the tomb of Caiaphas. Archaeology shows that this is good history <clears throat> and as well as any or better than any history ever produced by man. There is eyewitness character, manuscript reliability, internal harmony, and external corroboration. I'm not saying that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are perfect, although I believe they are. I'm saying if you accept that they are reliable history, what do all four of them have in common? They all say Jesus lived, he did many miracles, he died, and he rose again. Why would we accept these historians all the way through until they got to the end and they just made up some happy ending? They lived happily ever after? No, they tell us the main point of their story is Jesus is alive and he can change your life. That is what they say. So here is the way we reason. The Gospels are reliable history. If we know anything about them historically, scientifically, they're reliable history. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They tell us that the resurrection is a fact. And if the resurrection is a fact, then Jesus is who he said he was, God, and therefore he is the ultimate authority to tell us that the Bible is true. Now, I believe the Bible because I've seen its power to change my life and to change the life of many other people. But when we talk to people about the Bible, it's important that we don't say, I believe the Bible because it says it's true, or even because I have faith. But this might be a quick way that you can say, well, what do you think about Jesus? Was he a good man? Well, this good man claimed to be God, and he used as proof the resurrection and Look into the facts about the resurrection. Well, where can we find out about that? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Look into what happened. And so here is a shortcut to convincing someone that our book is the Word of God. Jesus, who is God, endorsed every word of the Old and the New Testament. And so you can trust the Bible. Join us again next week as we take our next step in studying the study of bibliology, the study of the Bible. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your book. Thank you for its message that God who made us, loved us, and sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. Thank you for rising from the dead. And thank you for the, the faith that we can have that the Bible is your word. Lord, help us to believe it. Help us to obey it. Help us to be changed by it. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next week.